Well, this morning, sisters and brothers, I'm going to focus on those two readings that we just had from uh, the end of Acts 2 and the end of Acts 4, and the snapshot that they provide for us of the early church in Jerusalem. Now, when I use that word church, and indeed when the Bible uses that word church, uh, it's not making reference to a building. So we're not talking about what the building in Jerusalem looked like at that time. Indeed, church buildings really wouldn't come into play until about the fourth century. So quite a while after the events that are being described here in the first century. Uh, now, when the word church is used in the Bible, it always refers to people. And in particular, people who are gathered together or who are in the habit of gathering together. So church is always about people. And when you think about that that's what the word means, then there's all different types of churches uh, throughout our world. So uh, last night, Lachlan went to what I would call football church out at Panther Stadium, as he and a bunch of others came together and watched a football game. Uh, other people might have gone to uh, music church where they went to a concert and uh, watched a band perform. So the, the whole idea of church, it's not a building, it's people who are gathered together or who are in the habit of doing so. And what makes a church Christian is when we gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we gather together to hear him speak to us through his word, as we uh, pray to the Father through him, and we come together to bring honour uh, to our great God, to our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, given who they are and all that they have done. And friends, you don't need to be in a sort of fancy-ish building like this in order to have a true Christian church. Now, if weather permits, we could uh, go to Chifley Park across the road and that would be just as much church as if we were doing it here. Uh, indeed, uh, a number of you uh, post lockdown in 2020 actually met up at the school hall uh, for church and it was just as much church there as it was here. So you don't need a fancy building for church. It's the gathering in the name of Jesus, no matter where you are. And uh, today, uh, millions of Christians across the globe are gathering together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, back in Acts chapter 2, uh, well, well, back at the start of Acts, I should say, uh, we are told that there were around about 120 people who were following Jesus, who were in Jerusalem and were gathering together and indeed learning from the risen Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Now, Jesus ascended into heaven, as we've heard a couple of weeks ago. He sent the Spirit as promised. And what happened was that uh, Jesus' disciples start speaking in languages of the people who were present in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches uh, about the fact that Jesus really is the Messiah. And 3,000 people became Christians on that day. And so when I say we're looking at what the end of Acts 2 and Acts 4 says about the early church in Jerusalem... We're looking at what it says about this community of 3,000 or so people and what they were like. And what I want to suggest to you is that Acts chapter 2 verses 42 to 47 and chapter 4 verses 32 to 37 provides a snapshot of what an ideal church looks like. I emphasize that word ideal church. Now throughout the New Testament, uh, we read about a number of different churches if you read 1 and 2 Corinthians, you see what a basket case of a church uh, the Corinthians were. Um, if you read Revelation chapters 2 to 3, Jesus addresses seven churches and five of them are told that they are doing things that Jesus doesn't like. Two of them are commended. We read about in the book of Philippians about Paul's joy in the partnership that he had with that church, their generosity towards him. But it wasn't a perfect church because he also speaks to a couple of the ladies in his letter and says, you've got to patch things up. There was division that was there. The Thessalonians, as we read about in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, they had withstood great persecution. Yet there were some who were lazy and weren't pulling their weight and they needed to be nudged and told what to do. Now, as we look at all of the different pictures of churches in the New Testament, I want to suggest to you that this one is probably as ideal as it gets. The church in Jerusalem at this point in its history, and I stress that at this point in its history, is an example of what an ideal church looks like. Now, what I'm going to uh, do this morning is I'm going to talk about why I believe uh, this church in Jerusalem was an example of an ideal church. And then I'm going to focus on 
uh, why, why it was they were like this. So we're going to focus on what it was about them that made them ideal and why it was they were like this. So that's where we're heading this morning. And, and, and for us, friends, uh, we want to be a church that brings honour to Jesus. We want to be a church that's pleasing to Jesus. And so focusing on these passages gives us the opportunity to kind of compare ourselves with what this church is like. And praise God for the areas where things are going well and come to God and pray and ask for help where we need to grow. So that's where we're heading this morning. Now let me talk about what it was about this church in Jerusalem that made it an ideal example of church. So, first of all, the church members were united. So Acts chapter 4 verse 32 a says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. Uh, these people agreed on what it was that they believed. You know, just as this morning we've kind of uh, declared uh, through the creed that we said, you know, these are the things that we, we hold in common. So these people agreed on what it was that they believed about God, what it was that they believed about Jesus and the Spirit. They agreed on those things. Indeed, uh, this church is really in its infancy at this point. False teaching hasn't had the opportunity to kind of come in and to cause problems. There aren't disputes over doctrine and all those sorts of things at this time. They are one in mind in that sense. But they're more than just one in mind. They're also one in heart. Uh, friends, these people, as they hear God's word taught, recognise that their identity is no longer that their sorry their identity is found now in Jesus. They are now Jesus people. Uh, they don't consider themselves to be uh, individuals who expect the world to fit in around them. Uh, they very much understand themselves to be a part of something bigger. They are if you like, little cogs that make up a big machine. And they actually quite happily uh, see themselves as part of something bigger and are contributing to that bigger concern. That's what it means that they're one in heart and mind. They believe the same things and they are thoroughly committed to one another. Now, before I give you an example of how that commitment to one another was shown, friends, the Lord Jesus prayed in John 17 for his people that they, that we would be, one, that we would be a united people. And so, no doubt, the way in which these believers were one in heart and mind would have been tremendously pleasing to Jesus. And again, I think stands out as a mark of what an ideal church will look like. An ideal church will be filled with members who are one in heart and mind. Now, the way in which we see this manifested brings us to the second thing about this church I want to highlight, and that is that no church members were in need due to the generosity of its members. Uh, so verses 44 to 45 of chapter 2, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And verse 32b, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. So these people understood themselves to be a part of the body of Christ, part of a bigger concern. And as part of this bigger concern, they recognised that they needed to help one another. Indeed, friends, we see throughout the scriptures that God has concern for the poor, for the needy, for the widow and the orphan. Uh, indeed, look at the result of this uh, sharing and of generosity and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? No needy persons among them. Remember, there's no Centrelink at this time. Okay. No needy persons among them. People are selling properties, they're selling houses. Uh, they don't even consider these things to be their own. They, they understand themselves as being part of something bigger and they quite willingly share. So much so, no one is in need. Notice what it is that's driving them to do that. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Friends, God's grace is his attitude of undeserved generosity towards sinners. 
Uh, friends, we are creatures created by the Creator God. As creatures, we really don't deserve anything from our Creator. And we are more than just creatures, we're sinful creatures. <laughs> creatures who have actually rebelled against the good rule of our good Creator. We don't deserve anything good from our Creator, but our Creator in so many ways showers us with grace, but ultimately through Jesus. See, through Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sin. Through Jesus, we can become members of God's family. Through Jesus, we can have the hope of eternal life where we will dwell with God in an existence much better than anything we could ever dream of now. We don't deserve any of that, but at great cost to himself, through the death of his son, God made that possible. God was so generous that he gave to his enemies his one and only son so that he died in their place to make these blessings available. And as these people reflect upon God's grace to them, God's generosity to them, so undeserved, it then really, if you like, is the fuel which causes them to then go and show generosity to others and to share so that no one is in need. It's a remarkable picture, isn't it? It's a remarkable picture. And one that would have been very, very pleasing to God who has a concern for the poor, the needy, the widow and the orphan. Now, this sort of display of generosity, this display of sharing did not go unnoticed. And this brings us to the third thing about this church. The church was looked upon favourably by all people. So verses 46 to 47 of chapter 2, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. Now, when it's talking about all the people here, it's talking about those outside. Now, friends, the church of Jerusalem, these people were not, as I said, meeting in a church building per se. They weren't sort of hiding away in a holy huddle. No, they're meeting out in the temple courts. Uh, they are meeting in clear view of all the people who are in Jerusalem. And it seems that as the people in Jerusalem witness the way in which these Christians are conducting themselves, uh, they witness the generosity that is occurring within this group of people, uh, they witness the fact that none of this group of people are actually in need because of this generosity, that they think, these are a good, good group of people. These are a really, really good group of people. Indeed, friends, uh, this uh, idea of favour uh, is one that certainly would have been pleasing uh, to God. For remember, the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5 uh, talked about our need as his followers to let our light shine before all people, to let our good works be seen by all so that God's name might be praised. The idea of uh, a church receiving the favour of all people is not so that the church itself might go, oh, gee, aren't we great, but it's so that God's work in the church will actually be seen. And this brings us to the final thing about this church I want to highlight, which is that unbelievers were being converted regularly and joining the church. So we read in verse 47b, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what's happening? Um, these people, these Christians, they're meeting in public, they're being generous, they're sharing, people aren't in need. People are looking at them going, wow, this is a pretty incredible community that we're kind of witnessing here. And so there becomes this great interest in finding out more. And indeed, people from the church were helping people to find out more. Uh, so in Acts 2.43, we read, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And 4 verse 33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So here the apostles are declaring Jesus is the Messiah. He is the great promised king. He is the only one by whom you can be saved. Uh, he is the one who will bring judgment upon all. They, they are declaring this news. And as they're declaring this news, something amazing is happening. They're performing all of these different wonders and signs. So they're preaching the good news. These wonders and signs are happening. And as a result of this, 
and the, and the example of the Christian community, people are being saved daily, we're told. Now, let me just talk about the wonders and signs thing for a moment. You might think, why don't the wonders and signs happen today as we kind of preach today? Uh, well, friends, believe it or not, um, there are three very distinct periods of wonders and signs that we see in the scriptures. They don't just happen all the time. There's three distinct periods. One was the time of Moses, when uh, the people of Israel were rescued from slavery in the land of Egypt and God gave the law to Moses. That time was a time of a lot of miracles. Uh, you move forward a few hundred years and the time of Elijah and Elisha, uh, prophets sent by God to speak to his people, to warn his people to turn back to him. Lots of miracles occur there. And then the third time, of course, is the time of Jesus and his apostles, uh, when the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Now, friends, what these three different things have in common is that they are all mark a new phase of God's revealing of himself to people. Through Moses, he reveals himself in the law. Through Elijah and Elisha, the prophets, they're the first of the prophets through whom God speaks. And of course, the gospel is revealed through Jesus and the apostles. And it seems that at this stage where this revelation is new, it's always accompanied by signs and wonders as a way of testifying that this has come from God. And then as the broad consensus grows that these things are indeed from God, you tend to see the miracles die down. Now, of course, God can do wonders and signs today if he really wants to. That's not an issue at all. But what's going on here is that God is testifying to the truthfulness of what these apostles are saying about Jesus. And people are being converted each day. And so here are these four marks of what I think an ideal church looks like. The church members were united. No church members were in need due to the generosity of its members. The church was looked upon favourably by all people. Unbelievers were being converted regularly and joining the church. Now let's ask, how are we going when it comes to these four things? How are we going? Are we one in heart and mind? You know, I actually think that the word I tend to use for our church at the moment is settled. That's the word which I think describes us, settled. Uh, we seem, you know, to be sort of on the same page in terms of what we believe. We don't have really any kind of big doctrinal disputes or things like that. Uh, praise God, false teaching hasn't sort of, you know, infiltrated in, so that's great. Um, we tend, you know, tend to be on the same page when, you know, what we're sort of trying to do as a church. So, so, so that's all sort of fairly good, right? Do we see ourselves as individuals though, or do we see ourselves as part of something bigger? Do we have a strong commitment to the whole? So I think that one in heart is part of that. I have a strong commitment to the whole. I don't just believe the same things, but, but I'm firmly committed to the whole. How are we going at that? Do we have any members in need? Now, again, we have Centrelink today, um, so there's that safety net there that exists. But are we aware of the needs of others? Are we helping when we know that there are people in need? I know those things sort of go on quietly in the background, and you might not be aware of some of the things, but there are people here who are very generous and who keep an eye out for others and help others and, and don't draw attention to themselves as they do so. That stuff is happening. It's not like it's not. But is it something we can improve on? Um, is our church looked upon favourably by all people? Graham was uh, just talking before in the announcement about how when we go over and be a part of things like Harvest Fest and not just go to it but actually help, uh, you know, with cooking and all that sort of stuff, that that actually has an impact where people go, oh, they're okay. Um, the pandemic frustrates me because it's halted our momentum in terms of engaging in the community, doesn't it? Because remember, a number of us were going over to the school, helping out with breakfast club, helping kids with reading assistance. Um, you know, twice the school has uh, honoured us with a community service award for the sort of the things we've been doing there. So, so it seems that, you know, in terms of um, when people actually know us, uh, they think positively. But what does our society as a whole think about church? 
My guess is quite suspiciously. And uh, because of things like abuse that have occurred within churches, uh, because of uh, judgmental attitudes on the part of people that were certainly not warranted. Um, so we've got to be kind of mindful of the fact that those that know us seem to be positive about us, but we do live in a society, though, where people tend to view the church suspiciously. So we've got a lot of work to do. And our unbelievers being converted regularly and joining our church. In the nearly 10 years I've been here, I think we've seen around 20 people make commitments of faith. In some parts of the world, they'd say that's a revival. Um, And yes, there is a sense where the ground is getting harder here and we give thanks for that. But given the freedoms that we have, given the ability that we have to declare freely what it is that we believe and opportunities to interact, I'd love to see more than just 20 in 10 years. So I think in some respects, we're going okay. All right? Uh, And again, I love this church. Um, I give thanks for this church. I consider it an absolute privilege to uh, to lead this church. But there's always room for us to grow. But how do we grow so that we are ideal in these ways? What do we need to do? Well, fundamentally, it's the power of God that enables us to grow in these sorts of ways. Without the power of God, that just simply would not be possible. Okay, And it was God's spirit at work in the church in Jerusalem that enabled them to be like this at this point in their history. And so that's fundamental. But it seems that God was working through these people to enable them to be like this as they were doing four things. And this brings me to my next point, which is that Acts chapter 2 verse 42 outlines the fourfold devotion of the church members in Jerusalem that resulted in them being an ideal church. So look at uh, Acts 2 verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They are devoted to four actions. Devoted. Now, devoted, as uh, one of the people in my Bible study said the other day, it means being full on. Now, not half-hearted, full on, they said. They were full on this church about listening to the apostles. They were full on when it came to the idea of fellowship. They were full on when it came to the breaking of bread. They were full on about gathering together to pray. And so let's now have a look at these actions one by one, unpack them. So they had devotion to the apostles' teaching. Chapter 2 verse 46 says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Why were they meeting in the temple courts? To listen to the apostles. That was one of the key things that they were doing. Notice they were doing it every day. Every day they're gathering together and listening to the apostles. Now, I'm not necessarily proposing that we start and service every day here. Um, that'd make it interesting, producing a sermon every day. Um, but every day, right? They're devoted. Now, now in our context here, we can certainly gather together each week in this large gathering. We have the opportunity to gather together in small groups to study the Word of God. And by the grace of God, we actually have Bibles in languages that we can understand. Uh, we have, most of us are able to read uh, these Bibles because of the education system that we're in. Okay, So the Apostles' teaching is really what we find in the New Testament here. And what were the apostles teaching? Well, they're teaching about how Jesus fulfills all of the Old Testament promises about the Lord, about the Messiah, about the Christ. So we are a people not just of the New Testament, but also the Old, because the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. In fact, you can't make sense of Jesus unless you're actually dealing with the Old Testament. And I want to suggest too, you really can't make sense of the Old Testament unless you're understanding of the New. These people were dedicated to the Word of God. And compared to many other people at many other times, the access that we have to this Word is incredible. And if we're not devoted to it, it's not because of lack of opportunity, friends. We have ample opportunity to be dedicated to learning from this word. And let me tell you, if we want to be a church that is one in heart and mind, if we want to be a people who are profoundly generous so that no one is in need, if we want to be seen favourably by all and see people come in 
to church converted, it's not going to happen unless we are devouring the scriptures. Our vision as a church starts with to be a Bible-centred church. It all starts with the scriptures. That's the foundation upon which we must build. We must dedicate ourselves, devote ourselves to learning from God's word, whether here on a Sunday, in small groups during the week, or individually, day by day. We have the opportunity. Let's make the most of it. Secondly, devotion to the fellowship. So it's literally uh, not just and to fellowship, but and to the fellowship. Okay, And to the fellowship is what the original language says. Now, so often when people uh, think of uh, fellowship, they think of morning tea. Uh, please don't think of that. Okay. Um, the word fellowship at its heart is all about sharing. Okay, It's all about sharing or partnering. That's the idea. Now, what's being talked about here is this idea of devotion to sharing with the community. Okay, that's what's been talked about. A devotion to sharing with the community. And we see this manifested, Acts 4 verse 32. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. So this idea of fellowship primarily here is focused on the way in which these people were sharing their possessions with one another. Some of them were selling land and houses in order to share so people weren't in need. Okay, this is a lot different than morning tea, right? This is the whole idea of saying, I'm part of this group of people. And my role within this group of people is to share with them. Let me ask you, do you think that way as you think about church? That I'm part of something larger and I am part of something larger in order to share with the others who also make up that church. Now, that sharing is not just resources. It could also be sharing time that God has given us. Uh, we are told that we are meant to weep with those who weep, uh, to uh, rejoice with those who rejoice. There are times when people just need us to sit by them and share that time with them to help and comfort them. Friends, we also have abilities, talents, gifts that God has given to each and every one of us that are to be used for the common good, okay? Not for our own benefit, but for the common good. Are we sharing those gifts, those abilities, those talents with others in the body to help them in their need? Um, JFK once said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And it's the same with church. If you're approaching church with a mindset of, I'm here to receive, you're approaching it all wrong. Dedication to the fellowship, devotion to the fellowship is devotion to sharing. And you know, if we are all sharing with one another, guess what will happen? We will receive. But our mindset must be one of sharing rather than receiving. Are we devoted to that? We live in a very individualistic culture which says that everything exists for me. It's a consumerist culture and if I'm not happy, I'll go somewhere else. That's not what church is meant to be like. I'm part of something bigger and my job is to share. We're all meant to share. Devotion to the fellowship. Thirdly, devotion to the breaking of bread. Some people think that uh, this refers to the idea of the Lord's Supper. And that might be part of what is going on there, but I don't think that it exhausts the full meaning of this idea. Uh, indeed, uh, chapter 2, verse 46b onwards says, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. Uh, so it seems that uh, the Christian community, they are you know, they'd have their big gatherings and then they kind of open up their homes to one another and invite one another over for a meal. And it seems that as they're having meals together, they're not talking about sort of trivial things. 
They're focusing on the things of God, on the things of Jesus, and maybe even sharing in the Lord's Supper together as they share that meal. Uh, The result is they're filled with uh, glad and sincere hearts and praising God as a result of these household get-togethers. Now, friends, there's something special when someone invites you to their home for a meal, isn't there? It, It sort of says to you, this person who is inviting me is wanting to kind of elevate the level of our relationship. And so it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Someone invites me to their home, elevates the relationship. Friends, if, if, if we want to grow our sense of community in our midst, I think this is a key thing we need to do. I need to get better at modelling it, I know that. Um, but inviting one another into our homes, sharing in meal together, discussing the things of Christ That's something we need to be really, really making an effort in. Um, I was reading Luke 14 yesterday and the Lord Jesus talked about, you know, when you invite people, uh, don't just invite those you like. Uh, Don't just invite the attractive people. You know, invite the poor, the lame, the crippled. Invite them all, okay? Don't discriminate in that sense. It's as we do that, that that sense of community, that sense of love, will indeed grow in our midst. And finally, devotion to times of prayer. Uh, It says, and to prayer, but it's literally the prayers, and to the prayers. And I take it that this is uh, a way of describing the set times of prayer that the people had at that time. So the Jews prayed three times a day, in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. Uh, And no doubt, the, the gatherings at the temple courts Uh, We're to hear the apostles, but also to join in these times of prayer. Uh, The times when they meet together in their houses to break bread also seem to be times of prayer. And brothers and sisters, it is so important that we are gathering together for times of prayer. Why? Well, we're not going to be this kind of church community unless we are praying. Prayer is the chief work of mission. Prayer is the chief work of ministry because God is the chief agent who makes things happen. It's only by the power of God that we can be like this. That's why prayer is so important. And again, in a moment, we're going to have a time of open prayer, where we'll encourage you all to pray out loud about different things that are on your hearts and minds. Week by week, we pray together as a church. In our small groups, we pray together as a church. And we run prayer meetings once a term, where we bring the different matters of our church before God in prayer. Now, as I think about the number of people that come to those prayer meetings, it's about 20 to 25 each time. Is this telling us that we're not devoted to times of prayer? It's about two-thirds of our people who are in small groups. Are we not devoted to times of prayer? Friends, we will never progress to be this ideal kind of church unless we are prayerful. Make gathering together with your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray a priority. So let's just wrap it all up. The ideal kind of church, according to the book of Acts, is one where people are one in heart and mind, they are generous so no one is in need, they are looked upon favourably by those who are outside and unbelievers are being converted regularly. That's the kind of church we want to be, friends. And we're going to be that church by the power of God as we, first of all, are devoted to the Word of God, learning from the Word of God. That's what it means to be a disciple, to learn. It's only going to happen as we commit ourselves to the idea that I'm here to share fellowship. It's going to happen as we open our homes to one another and break bread together, talking about the things of God. It's going to happen as we gather together to pray. Let us pray now that we might indeed be that kind of church. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise uh, for the gospel, for your grace, for the way in which you have uh, showered us with gifts that we simply do not deserve. And we praise you for the way in which you have called people to yourself and brought us together as a church. Father, we thank you for the good things that are happening in our church. Uh, for the people here who are people of faith, 
uh, for the, uh, the unity that we have in our beliefs, for the care that does go on within our midst. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the way in which our efforts in the community have brought positive responses and for the people who have been converted through the ministry of the church here. But Father, we want to grow more and more to be that ideal church. So please help us now, as a result of what we've heard, to be devoted to listening to your word and learning from it and putting it into practice, to be devoted to sharing with others, to be devoted to opening our homes to others and, uh, and breaking bread with them. And may we be devoted to gathering together to pray. Father, we acknowledge that these things are only possible by your power and so we pray for the sake of your honour, please work powerfully in and through us to be the kind of church that you would have us be. And we pray for this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.